FCS fans nation, welcome to FCS Sundays, The Overtime, a weekly recap show of the top 25 and the playoff eliminator. Thank you for tuning in wherever you get your FCS fans nation podcast, because we know FCS is best and where the playoffs are done right. Get into this. What is going on, FCS fans nation? Welcome back to FCS Sundays, the overtime on this very special selection Sunday. I know some of you could care less about what was happening in the FCS top five week recap show because your team just punched their ticket to go to the big dance. But for the rest of us, there's a different dance that I think a few people might be interested in. So here we are. We're going to run through the overtime. It's just me today. Uh, we're going to try to keep it bite sized under about 25 to 30 minutes and just roll through all top 25. Easy peasy to start here. Incarnate Word got a DNP. They did not play this week. They were on bye. The number 24 team, according to FCS stats, was Monmouth. Monmouth's first game of the year was postponed versus Robert Morris. So... Uh, that, the, that game also, you know, there you go. First two games out of the way. And we're only like 30 seconds in this is where it gets interesting. There were eight losses in the top 25 this week. Uh, that comes out to about roughly 32, 33% of the field, which is just, I mean, wow. What like every week we have like a weird week. And then even some of these games we'll get into, we're surprisingly closer than they should have been, but because there were so many games that were close, I've just got this hunch that there won't be a ton of movement, but we'll see. Um, UC Davis at number 23, hard fought loss at number two, Weber State, 18 to 13. They were up 10 0 going into halftime, really seemed to be controlling the game. And then it just kind of seemed there in the second half that Weber just became Weber. They started to run the ball. Uh, Bronson Barron started to look a lot better. Meanwhile, Hunter Rodriguez for UC Davis didn't look bad. Alonzo Gilliam still looked good. They're still able to put a couple points up on the board. But at the end of the day, this one was just one where, uh, you know, Weber, the energy, a little cold, people in the stands. Weber was able to kind of sneak, I don't want to say sneak out of win with this one, but going in the halftime, it looked like UC Davis might be the crown jewel of the big sky this year. But then Weber made sure to cement their legacy, take care of what they do at halftime. I think I saw on Twitter somewhere somebody said Jay Hill at halftime adjustments undefeated. Um, he showed that. You know, they're able to go 18 points, uh, 18 to 3 run there in the second half, and some questionable stuff down on the goal line for UC Davis. Um, you're, you know, like play calling there at the end. But at the end of the day, Weber proves probably why they're the top team in the FCS or one of the top teams in the FCS. Uh, they get a big ranked win against UC Davis. Number 22, Illinois State. Ooh, another tough one here for the 23 and 22 matchups. Number 22, Illinois State took a L at number five, North Dakota State in the Fargo Dome, 13 to 21. Once again, a game where, you know, I don't really know what's going on um, with North Dakota State. North Dakota State's kind of that team right now that just seems to like. I don't know. They, they made the change at quarterback. Forgive me. I don't have it off by the top of my head. Cam Miller, I believe, is what it is. Uh, they made a change at quarterback, able to come back. Even that, Illinois State made some pretty good drives there at the end. Um, just coming down to not having enough timeouts, taking a sack late, and going up against the Bison in Fargo. I mean, that's a tough task in of its own. Then when you kind of shoot yourself there at the end of the, you know, game trying to make something out of nothing kind of looking like momentum was there even though you still need the two-point conversion Illinois State tried to show they belong in the top 25 uh, I think this result shows that they are probably somewhere in the 20 to 30 range uh, we'll have to sort it out from here they haven't had exactly the easiest of roads here to begin the season uh, but North Dakota State gets another kind of like feisty grind it out close game something we're not super used to seeing out of North Dakota State in recent times, but something North Dakota State has done in the past, something that North Dakota State has won championships doing. So they take care of business. At the end of the day, you can only beat who they put in front of you. 
and that's what North Dakota State did. They win, they advance, and will probably stay a top five team in the FCS stats poll, even with a, a tight one there against Illinois State. Next up, another Dakota, South Dakota, number 21, loses at Missouri State. The fighting Bobby Petrino Bears get the win 27 to 24 uh, in South Dakota. The Dakota Dome. Uh, wow. I mean, end of the day, I don't know what people really expected from South Dakota. I know Kyler was on here last week saying he didn't know how South Dakota was even in the top 25 for when they lost to North Dakota. And then it does look, looking back at this, like they barely moved after that North Dakota loss. Um, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe there was something here. But, I mean, I think this loss to Missouri State, who – Typically tends to be a bottom, um, you know, team in the FCS or at least in the Missouri Valley, able to hold fight strong and win uh, on the road. Like for the Bears, this was a big win for the Coyotes. Probably the end of their season. Um, there's probably some miracle scenarios where they can still win the conference, but I mean that that was a big deal breaker. Might as well consider them eliminated from the playoffs. Unfortunately, that will be it for the South Dakota Coyotes. Number 20, Wofford gets an L as well at Samford, 31 to 37. That is four straight losses. So for those of you at home keeping track, the first five had two people not play and the other, or sorry, the first six had two people not play and four lose. How is this going to shake up? Does Monmouth stay in the top 24, 25 without playing thus far this season? Are they even going to be able to make the playoffs at this point? Incarnate Word did not play. Do they move up? Do they move down? Um, do they stay put at 25? And then you have, what do you do with Wofford, who lost to Stanford? What do you do with South Dakota, who lost to Missouri State? What do you do with Illinois State, who lost a tight one at number five NDSU? What do you do with UC Davis, that lost a tight one at number two Weber? I mean, that 20 through 26, 20 through 30 is just going to be a mess. Um, makes me glad I don't have a poll. Uh, but wow. I mean, Wofford, something that I guess we kind of expect they're one and two in the season. This will push them to one and three on the season. I think this is probably also eliminates them from the playoffs. Um, so kind of a big playoff eliminator, let alone top 25 eliminator this week, but big win for Sanford. You got to give it up for Sanford. Uh, I know this was a game where we had in the FCS fans nation pick them and a lot of folks were taking Wofford, but the Terriers just not able to get it done this weekend. Uh, and kind of a rough start to the spring season. Might be time to start adjusting for fall. Number 19, Delaware gets a win at home for Stony Brook, 31 to three Delaware quietly, maybe less quietly now starting to look like the best team in the CAA. We'll see. You still have your James Madison's there. Um, you, you know, Villanova we'll get to in a little bit here, but the, the blue hands like two and oh, you can only be who they put in front of you. Stony Brook's been a team that's been frisky the last couple of years, and they were able to handle it to them. This is back-to-back -back weeks where Delaware seems basically un, you know, unfretted, unchallenged, unable to go in and play not just mediocre competition, um, maybe like a James Madison had to start the year, but actually go in and play some you know, slightly better. It's not like they're world beaters, but better competition and really take care of their business. Uh, well, it'll be interesting to see what they do because the CAA North – Seems to be an absolute dogfight this year. So we'll see how they shake out. But, I mean, this was a huge win for the Blue Hens. Kind of solidified themselves in the CAA. I expect them to take a huge leap forward in the polls. It just sucks that all the teams behind them lost. Uh, and then you'll see we had a couple wins here in front of them. So it's going to be weird to see the movement going up. But there's going to be a lot falling out of 20 and down. But 19 and up, a little less movement. Um, but big win for Delaware. They just, they took care of Stony Brook. Uh, might be the best team in the CAA, uh, but they've got a difficult path. Uh, number 18, Sela, Southeastern Louisiana wins versus Northwestern state 27, 24. This is a tight one. This is, you know, what, are, what is Sela? We've, we've tried to judge them here for the last couple of weeks. It seems like we give them credit when they beat, when they barely lose to Sam Houston and then they barely sneak by Northwestern state. We just can't figure it out. They're a playoff team last year. They have the talent. They have the recruits. They have the coaching. They have a program. 
But, man, they just are very Jekyll and Hyde this season. You expect them to look a lot better versus Northwestern State. Off the top of my head, I don't remember who it was, but we just had a top 25 team play Northwestern State. I believe it was Nichols, and they beat them by a lot more. So, I mean, not what you want to see. At the end of the day, it's a win. You just got to win. If you, you don't have any blemishes, you know, you'll be fine. Uh, but it's still, that's that's a that's a close one. I mean, yikes. I, I, you win, but if you're southeastern Louisiana, I think you want that one to be a little bit bigger of a win. Next up at number 17, New Hampshire did not play. And then we have Eastern Washington. This one was an interesting one. Talking about, once again, teams that they won, but, man, Eastern had to use all but, I think, 50 seconds of the clock to be able to put this one away. They were trailing by, like, 9 or 10 points with like a minute 40, a minute 50, maybe three minutes, something. Under five minutes to go, they were trailing double digits, or double, two scores. Uh, Barry Eight pulls magic out of his hat all day long, able to really, I mean, Tyler Vanderwall for Idaho State looked like he was just throwing darts. He could put the ball wherever he wanted, where Barry had consistently was having overthrows. And then to pile on that, his wide receiver, his two interceptions are a hundred percent on his wide receivers who couldn't catch a cold if it came at him. Like bricks for hands. Every single ball, like one was right through the guy's hands, ricochets off his sh- chest and falls right into the arms of the the waiting Bengal defender. And then the other one was also like right through a guy's hands into the Bengal defender. Not to say Barry played amazing in this game. He put up a lot of stats, but a lot of overthrows, a lot of happy feet in the pocket. That did lead to him being able to extend a lot of plays, which also led to them being able to secure the win in this game. But, I mean, if you're Easter Washington, I don't have it in front of me, but when was the last time they were even pushed like this by Idaho State? I mean, you just you lose to Idaho, you blow out NAU, and then you have a close one against Idaho State. I mean – I think this was more of a scare than we need to be worried about Eastern Washington in the top 25. But once again, just another team where you're like, yikes, that was a little bit closer than it probably should have been. Now a team where it makes a little bit more sense here is at number 15, Furman. Uh, They're three and one. They end up winning at East Tennessee state, 17, three. So close, but East Tennessee state's kind of been a team that's been surging recently. Uh, They've had, they were in the playoffs, I believe two seasons ago. They, they started off the year pretty good um, playing. I don't remember what the game was, but it was one of the first games, I think that first weekend or the second weekend. And they played well and they won. And East Tennessee State and the Buccaneers are a team that's going to be able to give people challenges. Furman happened to do a lot after coming off um, the, the loss two weeks ago. Then they have the overtime win last week where we covered that we thought it was actually impressive that they were able to kind of fight back and not just like throw in the towel here. But you start, you can, it's, I know I give NDSU credit for this, but like you're going to win these dirty, dirty close games by four points or overtime and, or lose. It's, I mean, if you win, you'll take care of business. But the Paladins just, I mean, I feel like their fan base would like to see a little bit more points start to be built up in these wins, um, not have to wait for overtime and late game heroics to be able to, to pull out these victories. Number 14, Chattanooga did not play. Number 12, ooh, this was the game of the week. Sam Houston. Okay, they win at home versus number seven, Nichols. If you haven't seen this score yet, it's an inverse of each other. If you don't know what that means, it means that one score lines up with the other score, basically like boom, boom, boom. So like if it was 21 to 12, that. Take a guess, you at home, if you haven't seen the score. I'll give you five seconds. 71 to 17 against the number seven team in the country. Now, credit to Matthew Frazee on the FCS Fans Nation podcast. He said he thought most people had these teams flipped. He had Nichols at 10 and Sam Houston at five, where most people had it the opposite, obviously having Nichols at seven and Sam Houston at 12 in the official FCS stats perform top 25. But holy smokes, I don't think anybody saw 71 to 17. 71 points is what Nichols put on to some crappy, like, nobody's ever heard of D2, D3 school from Arkansas to start the year. Like, you're not supposed to do this against the top 10 team in the country. If somebody's going to move, it's going to be Sam Houston. And I know we've been big on the North Dakota Fighting Hawks and the resume they've been able to put together. We talked, they're the only school with three top 25 wins uh, 
why we are justifying maybe some people being able to give them a number one vote. You're looking at Sam Houston right now. They had a win against Sela that was ranked, still ranked Sela. Well, they and they won, so they'll still be ranked. And then they blow just, I mean, they burn this town to the ground. Like 71 to 17. I remember turning into this game at halftime and it was like 30 to like six something. And I was just like, wow, I'm going to find a different game to watch. Um, <clears throat> and I still at that point thought they'd probably like lay off. They probably win like 42, 24, something like that. 71 to 17. Holy Bearcat. Like, good for them. If you don't have them in your top five this week, I don't know what you're doing. They probably deserve number one votes. They have two wins this season. Once again, you can only play who they put in front of you. And those wins, absolutely impressive top 20 type of wins. Um, I think last week it was like 18 versus 19 or 17 versus 18. Like it, they were a top 20 team. CeeLo was, and they beat them. And obviously they had a lot of respect for Sam Houston because they barely moved CeeLo down in the ranking, but wow. Just, just wow. Uh, next up number 10, Jacksonville state got a win today. JSU, the only reason that we have to do this like late at night, it's 8.20 Mountain Time because we have to wait for that. And then it was Selection Sunday. And, man, I wish we just had Saturday football. Well, no, I don't. I enjoy the Sunday football. Um, but Jacksonville State's the only Sunday team this week. They get a win 37-20 against Tennessee Martin. This was a game that at one point was like only a 10-point game in the fourth quarter. But uh, today, Tennessee Martin and Skyhawks kind of can be challenging. Uh, it was on the road for JSU, but at the end of the day, they were able to take care of business. They moved to five and one, uh, just have a, a, a really good resume going forward. Um, it'll be interesting to see where the people start placing them because they've kind of been not getting respect um, due to them having, you know, similar type of seasons in the past, but this seems to be a very different team including the fact that some of this carries over from the fall when they're the only team to beat an FBS school and FIU. So if you're the Gamecocks, you expect to move up. Um, not as impressive a win. They maybe get your top five votes, but maybe solidify you there in the top 10. Um, the tied with them at 10 is Southern Illinois. So they get a win at number four, UNI, 17-16. So, there's going to be a lot of people that say we told you so. You and I being told they were ranked too high for a while after the whole NDSU, like North Dakota, South Dakota State, just weird SIU, and somehow you and I was team that ended up ranked above all those teams. <clears throat> you can hear the haters now. Southern Illinois being able to come away with this one, one point victory at home, uh, still doesn't mean that Northern Iowa is bad. Uh, this is a number 10 team in the country that they lost by 1.2 the end of the day that's a pretty good result it just sucks that you already had one loss the benefit that you have going for you if you're a panther fan is the fact that you're already in the top five you lost to a top 10 you should be top 10 if anybody moves them out of the top 10 uh, i mean wherever you had them right they shouldn't fall far depending on where you have siu if you had them as a number if you're one of these people that had them at four and you have siu at 10 and they lose to the number 10 team and you're going to move them behind 10 by one point. Like, I just don't get how you justify that. I mean, at the end of the day, I get like, I'd rather you use your eyeballs and actually see what the best 25 teams in the country are. Um, but I think that just contradicts yourself if you do it the other way, I guess. But Southern Illinois, <clears throat> big win. Uh, should move them up. Kind of helps solidify that what they're put together this year isn't just a fluke win against NDSU and they are somebody to consider in the Missouri Valley which all of a sudden became super weird that teams that were used to seeing like South Dakota State North Dakota State Northern Iowa may not be the case this year it may be teams like Southern Illinois and North Dakota which bonkers but you know we'll move on to number 9 Kennesaw State another uh, <laughs> triple option close one but Win at home versus Charleston Southern, 24-19. You know, it's it's Kennesaw Owl football, game management, control the ball, control the pace, get out with a win. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be big. Just get out with a win. However, the number nine team in the country, a team that has consistently been in the top 15, most people's top 10 all season, should beat a team like Charleston Southern by more than five. 
Um, if you're looking for somebody to move out of your top 10 off of a result, that's probably your move. I'm not a fan of moving people when they win, so I would say if you can, avoid it. But uh, at the end of the day, 24 to 19, uh, it just doesn't do it for me. It, it, it makes me question why they're in the top 10, but at the end of the day, they're probably a top 15 program. So it'll all sort itself out. But yeah, the Owls need a little bit bigger of a win. Um, but then again, they also haven't been playing a ton. So a little bit of rush shaking off there loud as well. Number eight, South Dakota State gets a win versus Youngstown, 19 to 17. Game winning field goal. Another team. This is why I'm saying the Missouri Valley, what's going on? You and I losing this Southern, uh, Southern Illinois. South Dakota State barely squeaking by Youngstown State, a team that has had a really rough go of it to start the season. I think all three of their games have been against top 20, or all four of their games have been against top 20 opponents. Um, poor Youngstown. I mean, that's difficult. And then you're able to take the number eight team in the country on the road to basically losing by two because of a game-winning field goal. I mean, that defense showed up. Their offense looked better than it normally did, which might just mean that South Dakota State's defense, maybe maybe there's some issues there, or finally Youngstown's figured it out. But either way, this, this kind of speaks volumes um, to the wins that other people have gotten over Youngstown. It means that Youngstown isn't just this bottom feeder in the Missouri Valley. They are difficult. They've just had an incredibly difficult start to the season. Uh, if you're South Dakota State, it shows that maybe people like me that had you as their number one or number two team early in the season uh, might have some reservations. Uh, at the end of the day, you won. You, you still control your own destiny. You still got the bison. Um, the problem is you got North Dakota in front of you who has already beat you. They got the game in hand. It's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out. If they keep winning, they'll be fine. They should make the playoffs. Should. It's weird that we're getting to this part in the season now. We're like, we're only like four games in for most of these schools. Some ga- some two games in, and we're already going, eh, this could be an eliminator. That that might have shut the door on this. Do they turn it? Now what do they do? Turn it towards fall? Who's left on the schedule? How does that impact the rest of the FCS? Um, but yeah, big little win for the Jackrabbits, but they do advance. We already covered number seven, Nichols, getting uh, breaks beaten off of them at number 12, Sam Houston, 17 to 71. Uh, Villanova loses versus Rhode Island. The number six team in the country falls 40 to 37 in overtime. Once again, a team that we just hadn't seen, you know, they kind of just started getting playing. They had a close one last week, I think on this show. I said there's a. I would have liked to see more from them. I think I said that Delaware looked better than them. I said them and JMU aren't really doing it for me right now. Their wins have been too close. And not even to mention, if you look at what happened to Elon this weekend, um, who just played JMU kind of close, like, yikes. They got beat by Richmond, JMU's big rival. If you're Villanova, losing to Rhode Island shouldn't happen. Now, I think Rhode Island probably every team in the CA is basically good. Like it's one of those conferences where, yeah, you make fun of some of the teams for not being super great, but at the end of the day, the majority of them are pretty stinking good. And from top to bottom, it's a difficult conference. So you're going to get results like this. Villanova is going to have games where somebody just gets them, but 40, 37 on your home field. When you're a number six team in the country, you were five last week and you're slowly slipping. I mean, you're out. Nichols lost, but to somebody that looks like a number one team, you lost to a team that I don't think even received a vote all season for the top 25. So not good for Villanova. We'll see what happens, but um, this is what the season is. It's carnage. Number five, North Dakota State beats Western, or sorry, beats number 22, Illinois State, 21 to 13. You and I lost at number 10, SIU, 16 to 17. So yes, for those of you at home doing your math, that is three losses in the top 10. Uh, the team's just outside of the top 10, obviously sharing a 10 this week with Southern Illinois and Jacksonville State. You also have Sam Houston, expect them to move up. And then somehow I missed that Albany at number 13 lost. So my apologies, talking about the CAA. Number 13, Albany loses at 34, 34-38 against Maine. Big, Albany coming off a big win last week against New Hampshire. Soccer ball kick, diving end zones, amazing Friday night game, and letdown. Lose at Maine. Um, but 
you know, a lot of weird movement going to happen probably in the top 10. And then, like I mentioned, that 20 to like 25 spot. Uh, number three, North Dakota continues to do what they do. Uh, they win first road game of the year, I believe, uh, at Western Illinois, 38-21. Yes, it's only 17 points. But I think going into this season, if you threw away what everyone's been saying about them and you said North Dakota beats Western Illinois by 17, 38-21, most people are like, oh, that's a good win for the Fighting Hawks. It is. But they're trying to gain the respect of the nation, like the nation right here, right? They're trying to get more number one votes than the teams ahead of them. They put together the best resume thus far. Sam Houston quickly approaching that resume, but thus far, North Dakota has the best resume. Big week this week. The nickel. It's the battle for the freaking Buffalo nickel. Like, it's North Dakota, North Dakota State. And I know some NDSU fans don't consider that a rivalry. Um, I think this year they're going to consider it a rivalry. It'll be interesting to see what, you know, what FCS Fans Nation and Twitter's looking like this week. But uh, at the end of the day, they went on the road. They got a win, took care of business, fighting Hawks. Still unblemished, unblemished. And at the end of the day, that's all you can do. Put yourself in the spot there because at the end of the day, you know what? Seating and everything, if you're in the top four, at some point you just got to go beat everybody. The championship game's at a neutral site. There's no home field advantage this year, really. So it doesn't matter. Just make sure you make the playoffs, make the dance, and put yourself in the best situation possible. That's what North Dakota is doing. They've got a problem because they got teams ahead of them that if they don't lose, they probably won't jump. And Sam Houston, like I said, quickly building a resume to beat them but if they want to make that jump they probably had to beat western illinois like 38 to 7 but they win that's all that matters number two weber state we are covered at wins at number 23 uc davis 18 to 13 and then the super undramatic closing to fcs sunday the overtime number one james madison postponed versus william and mary the tribe so that was your top 25 recap. Uh, sorry, the games. Um, I didn't have as much to talk about because I got so used to Kyler being here and kind of being able to bounce back what we saw. I think I just kind of covered what should happen in the top 25. So hopefully that's all right by everybody. But uh, if not, you at least know where the tw- top 25 did. You know that there was eight losses in the top 25 and like four or five did not plays or postponements. So it'll be interesting to see that 2025 spot. Keep an eye out for it Monday. Because uh, I think you're going to see a lot of movement there. And then see who sneaks into the top 10. What they do with Nichols after a really big loss to a South Sam Houston team that looks like they may be the top team in the country. It's an interesting week. Uh, if history does repeat itself, next week will be a little bit less in- interesting of a week. Uh, and then we'll probably have a really big carnage week the week after that. We seem to be taking weeks off and then big weeks of just, whoa. So either way, I'll be back. FCS Sunday, the overtime next week.
tumbled in overtime. Liam Welch. Back to pass. That's off of Ty King. It's intercepted. Number 12 will pick it up. That's Isaiah Wadsworth. Play of the game. Nice snap. We're going to pay attention to that today. Ball just delivered to the outside. And obviously, Ty King, don't know if he lost it in the sun. Mistimed it. Goes off the shoulder pad. Wyrick under center. To the air. There's a man open. Caught. Touchdown. T.J. Luther. Nice fake there from Wyrick. Enough time in the pocket to let the route develop. Corner route to T.J. Luther with his legs. That's Loveless who was in motion. And a handoff and a lot of running room and area to operate. And that is Jamari Brassard to us. And that one is going to be a big loss. Sanford sniffed it out. Walker Glamaris hammers it through. Three more points. We'll take a timeout. No twitch. Just good hands. Here's Stanton. We'll get the first down. So a whole lot of Jay Stanton. Watch his YouTube videos. Welch, his own number. Good yardage. First down. Liam Welch at the 50. Herb injury, and they're talking about carting him out of the stadium right oh. now, guys. That's Vice. Always a matchup problem. Gets to the 30, a first down. North South, extremely valuable. Getting the ball in the hands of one of the wideouts, Kendall Watson. What? Two QBs, and it's a direct snap and a touchdown. Chris Oladokun, the backup quarterback, scores on a direct snap. Pulls off. You want to? I guess they want to completely pull back there. Play action fake, and then back to Stanton on the dump off. And now Stanton makes his move and goes upfield and turns what would have been nothing into a first down. He's grown this season. Torrance Pollard was on the catch, and this is Ty King trying to get to space. And he'll have enough for a first down. Three receivers to the right side. It goes to Stanton. Oh. He's blown up immediately. Wofford is signaling for a fumble. It's going to be an incomplete, but it was a fourth down play anyways. Cole, talk How about, about John that, that formation. Try to get easy yards. And this is Peyton Derrick, by the way, at quarterback. And reception and a first down. Well, it's a handoff. That's Walker. What a bull he is. First down and more. Hard to get to a first down. So they go to the big guy, Walker. And Walker's got enough for a first down. Nathan. Going to the right side, man. Open and caught for a first down. Nice throw by Derek. Go. They like to hit the H in this situation. I'm watching him. He's open. Touchdown. Caught and called by Cole Kubelik. Welch. Handoff. That's Montrell Washington out of the backfield. You could just see how dangerous when that pigskin gets in his hands. Two time. Welch. Got a man. Caught. Out of the backfield. That's Transreno. J.R. Tran Reed. <laughs> no, that's pretty good. Handoff. Dakota Chapman reaches in for the six points and the touchdown. A little power football that time by Chapman. Welch will go to the air. First down catch, Ty King. Short of midfield. Welch looking for a man, goes up top. It's Ty King. Off of his hands, flag on the play. That's interference. I'm just saying with his patience. Welch to the air. Almost intercepted. Finneran hit from 50 last week. And Finneran will tie this game up. Running play to Walker. 
Look at Walker still going with those thick thighs. I think he's got enough for a first down. Wow. Less than a minute remaining now, and Wofford will try to run out the clock, but first a long run attempt. And now into Sanford territory before being pushed out of bounds is Irvin Mulligan. A Loveless back in as running back. He'll be there to block in the air in traffic. Caught T.J. Luther, and then Luther spins. Heads down the sideline and scores. No, he's out at the one. He almost lost his helmet. I don't know. His helmet stayed on. And then gets all the way down inside the five. I mean, he remaining in the half. The option, the touchdown by the Wofford quarterback, Peyton Derrick. Offensive line when you get these kind of looks. Third and four, Welch over the top, looking for King, got it! Touchdown, Ty King! Stanton, the lone running back. Fake to Stanton, over the middle, there's Ty King. King already with a first down. Ooh. Inside the 20, using that speed. Inside the 10, another long gainer. They will snap it to Oladokun, and he falls inside for a touchdown. Yard line. To the air. Also some running room. That's caught. Van Cleve, and he'll have enough for a first down. Just smoke and mirrors. Oh, you can still use it. It's there. There's some option. There's some option with some running yards. That's a big pickup that time. And again, back to Broussard. They trail by seven. Another play action off of it. And that's going to be intercepted. Long return. Here come a couple of flags. How about and that's Edmonds, Edmonds again. again. I know it is. He'll go for a touchdown. Whether it counts or not, there are three flags on the play. Side block against the linebacker, Cotton. Yeah, he, he peeled back. Now that's on after the catch, am I correct? It is, yeah. Okay. After the interception, I should say. Personal foul. Illegal blind side block during the return, number 28 of the return team. 15 yards from the spot of the foul. First down, Sanford. 33 on this Wofford defense. Third and three. Quick pass. He got Vice. And Vice tiptoeing his way not only to a first down, but into Wofford Terrace. This game against Alabama had a big season. Welch hits King. King cuts to his left, winds up at the 30, first down. You know, Ohio State was a Stanton. First down, Jay Stanton. With everything they've gone through. Montreal Washington in at wide receiver. That's going the other way. A little tie up there with Tony. Fennerin put Sanford up by two scores. Four for Wofford. At the very least, they should be able to flip this field. That's a keeper. And with uh -oh. some daylight. And now a fumble, and it is Sanford who picks it up. Chris Edmonds again. This is the keep that we've been talking about that has not been there for Wofford all day. Peyton Derrick pulls it. Plenty of daylight. Ball. Welch looking for some help over the middle. There's A.J. Tony. And it, it, it is not hidden when A.J. Tony has the football. Welch long for King. Oh, he goes up and grabs it. What a catch by Ty King, far side. First and 10, Sanford, from the turn. Ty King playing bigger than King Hippo right now. I mean, he's... Oh, he had it. This is for a 40-yard boot. And he is up and good. And limit yourself to that extent. I think that's Wyrick back in. It is. Yep. And pass complete. It's like this in games. Three to go for a first down. There's the option pitch. That's a first down and more. Got the matchup. 
Yeah, Parker by himself, and uh, Wyrick looking that way. Goes a little short. Out of the pocket. Man open, caught. One that he had at the end of the second quarter is a reverse. That's Van Cleve. He's got a first down, and he wants more. Taken down at the five. Carry. Back to Loveless again, and he is over the goal line. That's a touchdown for the Terriers. Wyrick gets it. Here comes the pressure. Steps away smoothly. Throws downfield. And what first down. How about that? Keandre Sanders. Pair of running backs on the ground. That'll be a first down. Got picked up. There has to be urgency moving forward. Chased out of the pocket. Time to throw. Two defenders there. It is intercepted. That will do it. Go ahead.